All right. Hello and welcome to Around the Horns. I am Aaron. I am here with my co-host, Zach. Before we get started, I was obviously out last week. I want to give a shout out to Travis who filled in on the show for me. I was able to watch that. Um, you guys did a great job. Obviously, I was off getting married and I was on my honeymoon. I know bad timing won't happen again. Um, so apologies to everyone that I had to miss the show. But uh, Zach, I also wanted to give a special thank you to you for running the show handling all the orange blood stuff doing the game recaps i i was reading those as soon as i got reception at the various ports on the cruise that was one of the first things i did you did a great job with all those i i am i'm glad to be back um first off i mean how was greenville i know you had you had quite the experience and go ahead and fill in the audience on all your travels and the rain delay shenanigans because i know that was a lot yeah you know greenville was a lot of fun a uh, small town built around the college um, they got, got some really good people there, some a lot of fun and food. Um, I ended up hanging out with the the ECU version of Occupy Left Field, the Pack the Jungle crew the entire time and Pirate Radio. Uh, they were, they, you know, great hospitality, great people. A lot yeah, of fun. I can tell from watching on TV. They seem very <laughs> friendly. Sure. <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, they uh, apparently ECU folks love uh, some Mexican food and tacos. So who like we had uh, we had street tacos. Day one, we had a whole hog day two. And then day three, I think there was so much alcohol consumed after day two that they were just like, screw it. Like you bring it, we'll cook it. So it was, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Sounded that way. I mean, tacos are always uniting people um, across the globe. Speaking of across the globe, I, we got off the boat in Cozumel and I just immediately, I was wearing my Texas shirt, which I normally like don't try to do, but it was, I think that was like Friday. So I knew it was like big, big day. I wanted to rep the team and, just immediately just just ambushed with horns down all across Mexico. I was like, this is just absurd. We need to, we need to figure it out across the country, but whatever. I I'm getting less bothered by it by the day, which we're going to get to it later, but Omaha, Holy crap. There's going to be some horns down in Omaha. Um, we'll get to that in a sec, but let's get into the baseball side of what we saw in Greenville. Um, Zach, I'll let you start off with the Friday game. I, I was able to watch highlights here and there. I wasn't able to, watched the full game as I was for Saturday and Sunday, but obviously Pete Hansen, um, I'll let you take it from there. It was, it was a tough start to the weekend. Yeah. You know, it, it was interesting because when, when I was talking to folks from ECU before the series, they kept telling me like, we're better in the splits against lefties. And I was like, that just makes no sense. You have a fairly left-handed dominant lineup. Um, you know, that just, that doesn't ring true. Like it's because you've been playing not great lefties or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not the case. They got off to a fast start against Hanson. You know, obviously Texas scored two in the first and everyone was like party on. ECU was having none of it. You know, they dropped a three spot in the bottom on Hanson. And granted, there was a there was a pass ball that, you know, got through and scored one. But they were definitely seeing Hanson's. They they were they came prepared um, and they came ready to hit and, you know, just mash. And so. Yeah. You know, they built a solid lead as we went through, what, five innings. Um, C.J. Mayhew, the lefty from ECU, after he gave up that two spot in the first, settled down and was like, you know what, I'm here to stay and, you know, struck out nine and just – he's a little like Hanson in the fact that he's not a hard thrower, but he has such great deception. He, you don't see the ball well coming out of his hand. Um, and he's got some late movement to it. So when he's throwing fastballs, it's got some late run in. Uh there were some questions about the, the strike zone in game one. I don't think either side was terribly pleased with uh, their performance, but you know, that's, that's what you get when you have college umpires and umpires in general, what's the ump show, right? Um, you know, Texas was able to make a run. They were able to come back a, a Hodo home run and fo uh, you know, folks try and just drag them back in as they've done all season. But, you know, again, that just a disastrous outing by Stevens and Nixon, um, you know, you, you can't drop a five spot in the seventh or eighth inning and expect to win. And so it proved too much. You know, the one thing that I thought was, was interesting is even though he gave up two runs, um, although one was, you know, after he left, cause he had a guy on base, I thought Morehouse actually did a pretty admirable job of like Hanson leaving early coming in and just trying to, you know, stem the tie, just hold the, hold the wall. And, um, so you like to see that, but man, Stevens just had, could not locate. And Nixon, I'm a bit shocked if we ever see him again this season, to be honest. Uh, you know, I just, I don't see it. So 
Yeah, no, I'm in the same boat with Nixon. I think, you know, earlier in the year, it made a lot of sense to keep running him out there, even though it was struggling, because if he finds it, you know, it's a big boost to the bullpen. But at this point in the season, I mean, we're Texas literally in Omaha now. So yeah. I don't think there's any reason to keep pushing it. There's other guys that are doing well. Go ahead and just try to reset Nixon for next year at this point. But um, that Friday loss, it put a lot of pressure on the team for Saturday, a lot of pressure on Lucas Gordon. My experience, um, the Saturday game was pretty unique to probably anyone else. Um, obviously, there was no internet where I was. Um, I, on ESPN2, that was had reception sometimes, they had the little ticker at the bottom of the screen that showed the scores. So I would just periodically run up to my room and wait for the little ticker to get to the college baseball section. Sometimes it would immediately show the Texas game. Sometimes I would barely miss it and I'd have to wait. 15 minutes for the ticker to come all the way back around. Eventually I saw the Texas won nine to eight. It didn't show any stats. It didn't give me any details of what happened. So I was just like, Oh, cool. Texas won nine to eight. Little do I know, like I get off the boat a day later and I'm just like, Oh, they were down five runs with seven outs left in the season. Like Dylan Campbell did what I just, I was blown away by what actually happened in the game. And then I spent time um, on Monday um, re why rewatch the full game just because I knew I wanted to see all of what happened. And I mean, Zach down five runs with seven outs left in the season on the road. That's, that's no joke. I mean, comes comebacks happen in college baseball, but that's not something to just be glossed over when the season is on the line like that in the environment that we saw there in the jungle um, to be able to rally in that spot. The clear change was they, they just changed the hitting approach mid game. You could see it. Yeah. ECU was peppering on the outside corner over and over too low. Um, whoever was in the dugout just obviously gave a big hitting advice and they just started peppering balls to right field over the wall. And that is just an unbelievable comeback. What was it like watching it in person with just the season? It seemed like it was, it, it was probably going to be over and then it wasn't. You know, it was crazy. Cause again, Texas gets off to a quick start, right? Yeah. They jump out to a lead and everyone's like, okay, this is what we expect again. And just as fast, Texas, you know, just starts trickling it away. Um, you know, at one point they were down 6-2, and I think it was in the fifth or – I think it was fifth inning. And, uh, you know, a pass ball gets by Silas and scores a runner from third, and so it makes it 7-2. to two. And you could, you could physically and just, like, emotionally tell that there was a difference in the stadium. The fans thought it was over. They could feel it, yeah. ECU was feeling it. Like, you could tell they had started the party. And I think I even wrote, you know, in the play by play, I was like, parties on ECU pirates are just going to be bananas here. Um, you know, they went from watching every out to watching every ball and strike and being like, no, no, we want another strike. We want this to be over right now. But, you know, as one of the things we've talked to the players after games throughout the year. And one of the things they've always said is like, we just stay consistent. We stay with our approach. We trust the process. Um, this, the umpire had a pretty lenient zone outside and they've been pounding sliders out there. You know, they went to their, um, to their bullpen as they had done all, all season, really. I mean, they don't have a set rotation and they brought in a guy that didn't have a plus slider. Terwilliger is known for his fastball and then more of a, a, a breaking curve ball. Yep. Um, and he just started going fastball at it. I mean, he was literally just like, I'm going to go pound the zone and get outs. And Texas said, great we're gonna see your fastball and just barrel the shit out of it and so yeah you know texas just started cutting through and they were like okay hold on you just score two runs let's get in out of there and we'll bring in carter spidey third team all american first team all uh all conference you know great great arm throughout the year i props to tulo and miller like texas was ready for every single pitch that came out of that guy's hand um and so they just kept they kept battling. Um, so they've been, of course, they get the four spot off the, the big messenger three run home run in the bottom of the eighth. Um, and then who is it? It's, it's Campbell, you know, hitting a, the go ahead run and everyone's going bananas. ECU is dead silent. They, they're in stunned disbelief. Yep. Um, so we go, we go to the ninth, two outs. Dre's looking really good. He's got his breaking ball working. Um, you know, his fastball was sitting 88, 89. So he still doesn't have his velo back, but he would have thrown that, that hammer on him and they were just grounding out. Well, two outs, 
the second second baseman Starling, who's you know been up and down on the season for them, but has come through in some clutch performances, hits a just a bomb to left field, and everyone was just like, "Oh shit, here we go again with the Texas bullpen." <laughs> place was rocking when they play, hit that, home run. that place went bananas. Like I'm pretty sure if you looked at you know some seismographs or Richter scales, there was a little rumble over in the in the Carolinas during the ninth. Yeah. So, you know, Texas comes to bat and, uh, you know, it's, it's, who is it? It's, I think it's Ivan that leads Ivan off. leads off. Yeah. Everyone's mm-hmm. waiting for the walk off homer. He dumps a little bloop in the center. He dumps a blooper in the, in the center. And like, everyone's like, okay, you know, that's fine. Like we didn't give up a home run to this guy. Like we're, we survived the onslaught. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing was, and this could have really cost him. Um, and like, in daily. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the press box, everyone was like, oh my gosh, like, Daly had been put in defensively in the ninth for Murphy Staley, which Pierce has done a lot during the season. I mean, it's not something that's new, but it's never been an 8-8 ball game to decide the College World Series trip, right? It's yeah, it's where like Daly's coming to bat. Like, surely he's bunting. They're not going to let him just pop it up or, you know, try to get one. You know, credit to Daly. He came in in a tight spot. He's not the best bunter in the world. He laid down a perfect bunt to move Ivan yeah. over. It, yeah, he but kinda, it was he not a perfect one because he popped it up. <laughs> yeah, it dropped though. Interesting too on that. Um, the announcers missed it too because I was rewatching the game on Monday, like I said, and the announcers completely missed the fact that Daly had come in defensively the game before, yeah. and they were just like, "Oh, they're pinch hitting Mitch Daly for Murph Staley." And I was just sitting there oh, on my yeah. couch. I was like, "I would bet a million dollars that Mitchell Daly was in the game at second base, the half inning before." Yeah, so they was. completely missed that. So. And if anyone was confused on that, they didn't just randomly pinch it for Murph. Daly was already in the game. And it's funny that they would have missed that because I'm pretty sure both of the outs, it was either in the, I think it's both of the out, the first two outs in the ninth were ground balls to Daly, if I remember correctly. I don't remember that, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. But anyway, so Daly pops it up and everyone's like, oh, and it drops in. And I was like, okay, you know, whew, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they move Ivan over to second. Um, Anyways, they, pitch around, they pitch around Todd and then Silas also gets walked. Yeah, so so Todd gets a gets the 3 0 count, and they're like, you know what? Never mind, just take a base. Yep. Silas is able to draw a walk, which brings up Messenger. And everyone's like, hey, Messenger, like great at bat, you know, 370 on the year. He's come through with some absolute clutch hits. The dude like reaches for a, a ball way outside and just pops it up. And we're like, Okay, <laughs> no, that's that's cool. So two outs, and you got Campbell coming to the bat. Now Campbell riding high from the last inning on hitting a go-ahead home run, and everyone's like, you know, uh, well, maybe we'll take it to extras. That'd be nice with two outs. He gets a strike, and then he gets a ball that just it it looked like it. I couldn't tell, but it looked like it came in. It had a little bit of run inside, and he just went the other way with it as they had done all series. Texas said in the post game, like they kept throwing to us outside. We kept sending it over the right field wall. Um, and obviously he didn't home run, but you know, he lined one in the right field. And I don't know if the right fielder just got a bad read on it or just doesn't have the quickest first step, but you know, it looked like it could have been a play in right field, but it fell in. It was know, weird. Yeah. I had the exact same thought watching it. When I watched a replay a couple of times, I was like, could he have caught that? Mm-hmm. And then I watched it a couple more times and then the ball hit almost right at the base of the wall. Yeah. The only real chance he would have had is to basically sacrifice his neck and just do a full head first dive (laughs) into the wall. So that ball wasn't being caught. The ball that could have been caught that would have changed everything in right field was the one that Faltini hit in the seventh before the Hodo home run. That ball could have been caught. I don't know if you could see it that well from the press box there, but watching it on TV, the right fielder for ECU, if anything's going to haunt him from that game, it's going to be that ball from Faltini definitely could have been caught. And that would have obviously Hoda wouldn't have been able to homer there with two outs that could have changed things. Um, I mean, there was a lot that happened afterwards. Yeah. And and the field was, was playing slower than I anticipated. So I don't know if he just, Again, they didn't get good reads or what it was, but yeah. It was both, a wet outfield, yeah. Yeah, in the right outfield. Both both of the guys just, they didn't quite, like, take the read that and run in the route you would expect. So, yeah, I mean, it falls in, and, and 
you know, that stadium emptied out very quickly. Like it was dead silence. They were like, oh my God, it's happening again. How could this be happening to us? Um, yeah, yeah no, I mean, it was, it was incredible to watch. It was incredible to follow. Um, I mean, obviously people are always going to remember the messenger home run and then Campbell, what he did in that game, the unsung hero. It's, it's gotta be Duplantier. Um, he was incredible out of the bullpen, just the overall turnaround that he had coming back from injury first couple of midweek starts of the season looks great. You know, we think he's going to be a great option all year long. Yeah. And he hits the spurt where he just can't stop giving up home runs and it just doesn't look good. The stuff's not electric. The slider and the curb aren't moving the same, but he clearly put his head down. He kept working. He never gave in. And to be able to come through in that spot. And then not only, I just liked how he responded after he gave up the home run in the ninth to be able to immediately bounce back. There's two outs, get the next guy out, get Texas yeah. back in the dugout. That was huge not to let that inning spiral out of control with two outs. He did a great job. So that's not going to be the first name that comes to people's mind whenever they remember that Saturday in Greenville, but that definitely should be a big one. And obviously Sunday rolled around. Uh, we can get into all the rain delays and shenanigans if you want to, but I mean, there was just too much momentum for Texas. Obviously ECU, the fans knew it. The players knew it. The coach said it after the game. Saturday was the game to win. Yep. When your five outs are, yeah, a couple outs away from Omaha at home with a big lead and you don't get it done. We saw it happen to Arkansas in the College World Series against Oregon State that one year. When that fly ball dropped and then Oregon State walked it off, you knew Oregon State was going to find a way to win the next day. It was kind of a similar situation here. Ivan hits the huge homer in the first inning before the rain delay and then yeah, it was just kind of smooth sailing. And then man, Tristan Stevens, I mean, what it, I mean, you can say a lot about what Tristan Stevens did. You know, and it was funny because before the series started, Coach Godwin, his only comment about the Texas team, he was like, I haven't watched the pitching. I don't know anything about what about Ivan? We're not gonna let him beat us. First inning, you know, hits a three-run bomb. And yeah, um, you know, that crowd to that to the credit of the crowd, like they never stopped cheering, they were never out of it. But you could just feel that, like, oh, my God, it's happening to us again, just like in 2016 against Texas Tech. You know, we, we missed the opportunity. What have we done? Um, and, you know, Texas, like, that first inning could have been even bigger, except for <laughs> there, was, there was one out. And, you know, talk about a momentum killer, the, the deluge, the rain, <laughs> wasn't actually coming at that time. But Silas has a 1-0 count, you know, it's overcast, but still sunny. And also the, the umpire throws his hands up, tells everyone to get the hell off the field. Now yeah. makes a call. Like everyone's got to get out of the stands because we're in a lightning delay, which we kind of assume because there had been storms in the area. Like UNC Arkansas had been in a sunny lightning delay earlier in the morning, but no one knew that it was going to be, you know, five and a half hours later that we'd finally get to play because for the first hour, there was no rain. And then suddenly it was like, well, never mind. Now it's going to pour. And, you know, they probably had more rain on Sunday than Texas has had all year to this point. The field was completely underwater. It stopped raining at one point. They started to remove the tarps and were like, hey, this is pretty cool. No, no, they were flipping the tarp over to let the one side dry. And it was like, okay, this is not good. <laughs> classic, classic D3 baseball move, by the way. Playing baseball in Conway, Arkansas, I was part of many um, tarp dumps to where it just gets to where there's too much water sitting on the tarp, so it becomes detrimental to the infield. Yeah. So you're better off just dumping it in the outfield. So, yeah, they pulled the old rope-a-dope on you guys. <laughs> it, it, they pulled so the old the rope feeling. And, uh, you know, of course, it didn't help that uh, – at that point, then the outfield was literally underwater, especially right field. Right field was the worst. Like, I don't know the elevation of their field, but I'm pretty sure that everything drains from left to right because left looked pretty decent. And then starting about center, right, you know, dead center to right was just a lake. So I called that Lake Zach. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, it was just a complete lake. Now, credit to this crew and whoever built the stadium, I've never seen water drain off a field as fast as I did against or at ECU. I mean, within 20 minutes of it stopped raining, the water was gone as far as like a giant lake, right? Like, and there was obviously still water and they had the broom crews out there trying to sweep up. So everyone got everyone excited. Everyone was like, Hey, we're going to play. Oh, hold on. There's another storm cell coming through. We're going to wait another two hours. Um, you know, Craig Ways listened to the ESPN box. 
they're getting bad information about it's start time. Everyone's getting excited. Um, you know, it just, uh, the craziness, right? Um, but we finally got going at 10.15 or 10.20 Eastern time, uh, five and a half hours plus after we started. And Texas, you know, the, the reliever came in, Trey Savage. Great last name, by the way, for a bullpen guy, you savage. Um, came in, got two quick outs, and everyone was like, oh, man, ECU is going to take the momentum. Stevens comes out. Uh, wow, what a performance by Mr. Stevens. I had said earlier that there was no there was no Austin Wood. There was no Chad Hollingsworth. Well, you know what? There's not. There's a Tristan Stevens. Dude came out and threw up a zero. What does Texas do in the second inning? They decide they're going to do one better and throw up a five spot. Um, and the game was, you know, officially over at that point. It was just a matter of recording a few outs. So, yeah, um, the Tristan Stevens stuff, it was incredible. I mean, I even thought in the first couple of innings, he, he wasn't that sharp, especially the slider. He was a little up in the zone, but he was competing his way. Um, but as the game went on, he started to get really sharp. And then we started to see vintage Tristan Stevens. The changeup was really good. That was really helping him out against those lefties that you mentioned. Um, the slider got a lot better. And he was just running on pure adrenaline. I mean, to go over 100 pitches after pitching on Friday and Saturday, even if it wasn't for that many pitches, that's still an impressive thing to do, just be able to get up and down like that. But we just know what Tristan Stevens is about. He's all about Texas. He just wants to win at all costs. He wants to help the team. When he was not pitching well during the year, you could see it was wearing on him. He was getting upset. He would sit in the dugout for a long time after the win. And that wasn't because he was just feeling sorry for himself. That wasn't because he was just so upset with how he was pitching. It was just David Pierce had said it multiple times. He felt like he was letting the team down. He yeah. just cares so much about the team. He cares so much about the program. And for him to be able to get the ball in that game and then to come through and deliver just six huge innings um, after the bullpen had obviously been taxed, it is so impressive. And you couldn't help but just feel happy for him because he came back to Texas to get to Omaha and to be able to – be the one that basically put them there on Sunday with a lot of help from the offense, obviously. Yeah. That was just, that was a lot of fun to watch. It was great to watch his reaction after the game. Um, so yeah, that was just really great to see overall. Yeah. I mean, it, it really was a kind of a vintage Tristan Stevens start where, you know, he's never been a strikeout guy. He'll never be a strikeout guy. He plays to a lot of contact, but you trust your defense and, you know, you, you throw balls that help, the defense out by giving you soft grounders or pop-ups, whatever fly outs. Um, you know, it was, there's a lot of guys that say they play for the name on the, on the chest or on the Jersey. Not necessarily all of them do, right? Like if th that guy has a, you know, big time offer. He's going to do what he needs to do. Stevens legitimately plays for the name on the front of his, on the front of his shirt. I mean, he plays for Texas. He is a Texas dude through and through all the way is from Missouri. Um, yeah, yeah it, it was cool to see him. And then, you know, Southern coming in to get the strikeout for the final out was fun. You know, power to, shout out to Blue Powerade there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it was a really fun game to watch. Um, only bad thing was it did end, you know, won something in the morning. And then at, uh, at 2.15 is when the press conference ended between – the media and the Texas players because ECU had gone first. I had a 6 a.m. flight in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is an hour and a half away in case you don't know distances in Eastern Carolina. So I immediately got in my rental car, drove to Raleigh, took about a 30 minute power nap, hopped on a 6 a.m. flight back to Austin. So yeah, it was a, uh, it was a good day and a half of uh, fun and travel. <laughs> yes. Good stuff. And now you're here with me, uh, with me on the show. So now we're here. it's all, it's all worth it, but yeah. yeah, I mean, Texas, obviously, they made it through the regional. They made it through the super regional. We're going to Omaha. I've just kind of two big picture takeaways that I want to get off my chest just from the regional and the super regional. We talked about it coming into the postseason that if Texas, they can definitely win the regional. They can win the super regional. We both picked them to make it to Omaha. Um, but we knew the margin was going to be thin. We thought this team just with the bullpen and the lack of a third starter, they've got to, they've got to start 2-0. and And then in the super regional, they've got to go 2-0. and and it, it doesn't feel like that necessarily has to be the case anymore just because of what we saw from Tristan Stevens. Because of Southern's emergence, he's shown the ability to go to a couple innings. 
What uh, Dre, um, Andre Duplantier, has been able to do out of the bullpen, he's starting to make a little bit of a comeback. Even Travis Staley, yet again, he's starting to show he can get some stuff done in spurts. I think, obviously, winning the first game is huge. The team that starts 2-0 in the regional format in, the, in Omaha in that you know, half-bracket play, that team's going to be in the driver's seat every time, no matter what. You really want to do that. But I'm feeling better than I was a couple weeks ago if Texas is to drop one of those first two games, that they will, the pitching will at least be able to give them a chance for the offense to be able to win with eight or nine runs. And I didn't feel that way in the past. So just, I want to get that off my chest. I feel like they have a chance now, if, even if they have to go off script and come out to the loser's bracket, but obviously you go all out to win game one and game two, that obviously doesn't change. And then um, this, is, this is to take nothing away from Texas or to take nothing away from ECU. Texas took advantage of a nice draw, man. I mean, not having to play a single power five team in the regional or the super regional was pretty nice. Um, it's baseball, non-power five teams. It's not the biggest deal. ECU had a ton of talent. They had a lot of older guys. The home field advantage was better than, you know, just about anything you'll see in a power five school. But we saw it across the country. Ole Miss, you know, one of the last teams in the tournament, they make a run just because they've got a lot of talent. Arkansas is a two seed. Oklahoma is a two seed. Notre Dame, I, I mean, I guess you can't call them power five, whatever the heck Notre Dame is. They're a big name school. They were able to come through in a tough regional. And then obviously we'll get to that. I mean, they go to Knoxville and knock off Tennessee. So Texas got a nice draw and then credit to them for just taking advantage of it, using their talent, using their experience. I mean, Zach, if we would have said in February, Texas is going to Omaha, we would have been like, duh. Then we would have made, if we were to go to April or after Oklahoma State, we say Texas going to Omaha, we would have been like, okay, not sure about that. We were never guys that said, no chance, this team's not going to Omaha. We never said that. But I mean, there were times where we would talk and we'd just be like, things are looking rough. I don't know. The, the margins are getting really thin. What is your just overall reaction of this team, just the ups and downs? And now we're here. I mean, they made it. Yeah. I mean, Augie, Augie Garrido always talked about there being three seasons. There was the regular season, um, you know, including conference play, and then you get into postseason play, and then there's Omaha. The goal is always Omaha every single year at Texas. They've, they've been more times than anyone else. Um, and after their experience last year, I mean, they returned the vast majority of their team, which was one of the reasons they were number one in the nation to start the play game, uh, start the season. You know, this team didn't ever think they couldn't get there. They had that belief, which I think goes a long way. Helps that you got some good talent, but um, you know, it was it's one of those things where it's like, well, this seems very improbable. And they just, you know, they kind of grind, they're just the grinders is the best way to like they're not the most talented team, right? They're they're not Tennessee. Yes, they have an amazing offense, but they've also had an offense that's struck out 15 times in a game. They've also um, got a pitching staff that's given up 10 runs, eight runs. And so if you really look at Texas as a whole, I don't think we've still seen a game in which all three kind of all click together and they just absolutely dominate across the board. Yeah. We've seen it since, in spurts. Since February. Yeah. Since February. We've seen it in spurts. We've seen it in, you know, a couple of innings here and there. Um, but it just feels like a team that people are not going to want to see in Omaha for other than the normal, they hate Texas reasons. Just because they they play clean defense, they can hit the ball well. I mean, I think they're the highest rated defense and offense coming into the Caldwell series. Yep. And you get a pitching staff that has the talent and is dangerous enough to keep you at bay. Like that's just a, a recipe for success because you got guys that are are juniors and seniors leading your team. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a it was somewhat improbable, but. I'm not shocked at all that this team kind of turned it around enough to make it there. Yep. I mean, they said all year, we've got a lot of confidence. We're not going to give in. And, you know, they held their confidence and they never gave in. So credit to them. Um, I mean, let's get to Omaha. So the teams that made it, uh, the bracket, I mean, I'm going to get to it later, but it just, it, it could not be more wide open in my opinion on bracket number one. So these four teams will play in a regional format and the winner will make it to the best two out of three championship series. We've got Texas versus Notre Dame on uh, Friday night at six o'clock. And then we've got A&M versus Oklahoma. I, 
I guess someone technically has to win. That's unfortunate. Someone has to lose. That's good. Um, that'll be game one of the entire College World Series. That'll be Friday at one o'clock. So, and then we've got Arkansas on the other side. You can go ahead and just rename the College World Series this year to the Horns Down Invitational because, I mean, there's going to be a lot of burnt orange in the crowd, but then after that, it's just, it's going to be an endless sea of haters. I mean, the amount of hate thrown toward Texas is going to be insufferable it's just be prepared if you're going to omaha just just be ready for it it's going to be a lot yeah i uh i was thinking about calling up the guinness book of world records to see if we could get like a, a statement or a recording of the number of like what's the record of horns down at any given time in one place what are the number of haters of texas at a given in given time at one place it's going to be sad i'm pretty yeah. sure we're going to exceed both by wide margins um you know espn loves to go out of their way to be like oh it's been an inning since we've seen a, a horns <laughs> down sign let Cut to that guy out in left field. Yeah. Oh, nope, there's one in right field. We can get this young kid that's drinking on the wall. Like, please, by all means. No, they're just going to be waving people down. They're going to see two. Like, hey, guys, come over yeah. here real quick. You guys want to do the horns down in front of the camera? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, sure. It's just, yeah. Like, it's, you know how that uh, music festival is like ACL? They have the big opening. Like, you know, everyone wants to go take their photo in front of it. They should just yeah. have like a giant like photo booth for every, like, go get it out of your system. Just go to the photo booth. We'll give you your picture. Like, great. You made it here. Now get the hell out. You did your horns down. Um, yeah, Maybe Texas should do that as like a sneaky, like NIL fundraiser type thing. We get a bunch of like Occupy left field guys. We just dress them as like normal people. And then we make some fancy like horns down display. And you just charge like a dollar for people to take a horns down photo in, some, in front of some display. And then we're just secretly funneling that money into NIL to like try to get like Tommy Tanks or Maui Ahuna. Maybe that's the way to go. Who knows? Um, oh, yeah. So you, you, you were out of the country, by the way. Maui Hoon is going to Tennessee. Did so he commit? He's, he's committed. He's gone. Ah, oh, stupid cruise. I'm going to miss that. <laughs> so he's going um, here. Man, that's, oof. That, yeah, that's a good good job by them. Yeah. Tom, I think still available, right? Still on the market? I mean, I know he's, yeah. he wants I mean, he's, to he's probably pretty locked into Florida State, but yeah. Yeah, I know. All but, right. Well, well, whatever well, transfers we can get. The one guy that is loving this College World Series field has to be. Chris Del Conte, because all he sees are big dollar signs. Thank you for yeah. my trademark money. Make it rain. Make it rain. <laughs> so yeah, no, no um, doubt. Um, but look at looking right. at Omar, looking at Omaha in general. Uh, you know, this is the thirty eighth trip to te- uh, to Omaha. It's basically let's buy a vacation home for everyone and just set up camp at this point. Um, I think I saw a stat where there's been seventy five College World Series, yeah. twenty twenty notwithstanding. Texas has been in 38 of them. That's, that's pretty good. I mean, there's a 50-50 shot every year of Texas being in the College World Series. You can't say that for, well, any other team in the nation. So that's, that's neat. Um, if anyone's curious, the second most is Miami. They have 25. They also have not been to the CWS since 2016. Miami's one of those perennial, super regional, regional losers where they just decide that they're not going to show up and get bounced. I don't know what's up with them. Um, but I did look. So the last four College World Series, so 2021, 2018, 2014, and 2011, in each of those, Texas lost the first game. Yeah, I think yeah. we need it in the streak. Yeah, not great. Um, now, during that time, they still were successful. I mean, they got third place twice, and then they got seventh place twice. So, you know, 50-50 shot, you lose the first game. You're either making a run and coming up short, or – you're getting bounced. You're going 0-2, and, and you're, you're getting tossed out of the College World Series. Um, the last time that Oklahoma, or, uh, Texas played on the road was 2005 in a Super Regional, and that was against Ole Miss. So a little history here. Everyone knows what happened in 2005. Texas, you know, they raised the banner and they won it all. So, hey, fifth time. Maybe, there, maybe there's some historical uh, trends going on with us, but we'll see what happens. Notre Dame, on the other hand, the, the first opponent of Texas, been to 23 regionals. Uh, they made it to Omaha twice. Interestingly enough, they actually knocked Texas out of the College World Series in their first trip back in 1957. So just a couple of days ago, right? Yeah, I remember that one. I remember. Yeah, you remember that one. And then, uh, and then 2002 was the last time that Omaha invited Notre Dame into its realm, which is another interesting year because who won in 2002? Texas. So, you know, things are, things are lining up. I like, I like these little nuggets of uh, Texas success, but uh, yeah, no doubt. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's go ahead and get into that full 
matchup against Notre Dame. I mean, yeah, we mentioned it before. It's an old team. I mean, just just a lot of geezers, a lot of uh, grad students, you know, COVID seniors. They've got a lot of experience. They don't have experience in Omaha, like you just mentioned, but they've got experience in general. And man, they they just went into Knoxville and knocked off one of the most talented college baseball teams that we are going to see for a very long time. I mean, I know college baseball is unpredictable. And the number one seeds haven't had a lot of success lately. That Tennessee team was a different class, man. Even compared to like the Arkansas team from last year, the Tennessee team this year, I mean, there was no holes in that roster. Every part of that team was elite. Yeah. And for them to lose at home to Notre Dame, man, credit to Notre Dame. They are, they are going to be coming in uh, quite confident after winning that type of super regional. That was unbelievable. Yeah, that was, you know, knowing that there were potential first round uh, matchup with either Tennessee or Notre Dame, if Texas made it, we were kind of watching off to the side and yep. you know, everyone kind of quipped like Notre Dame did what everyone's been trying to do against Tennessee all year long. And Kentucky was also did the same thing and was successful. You hit a couple early home runs. I think they had four home runs in the first four innings. I mean, they were just mashing the ball on Friday. Um, you just jump on them and you don't ever let your foot off because if you do, Tennessee is going to beat the heck out of you, which is what happened on Saturday. Um, the crazy thing to me is the fact that on Sunday, you know, Tennessee was up, I think, five nothing. And it was our late inning failure. Like the stress was just too much for that team, which is surprising because Tennessee was in the College World Series last year. Um, but yeah, giving up that three run home run was just a backbreaker for Tennessee. And then, of course, um, you yeah, know, they went back to back and then they went, they went back to back with three spots in the seventh and eighth. Uh, you know, it, it was crazy. It was a fun game to watch, but uh, Notre Dame, they're, they're no joke. Um, I doubted them very much early in the season. I just didn't think they had the horses to get there. And, you know, you look at their stats and they're nothing particularly overwhelming. It's just a solid veteran team that continues to battle. So uh, it's, it'll be interesting matchup. Yeah, no, I mean, that's my main takeaway. The team seemed very, very evenly matched. Um, Notre Dame has a lot of experience just from being old and, you know, in their mid-30s. And then Texas has a lot of Omaha experience just from being there. They've got some older guys, too. Yeah. Um, we think it's going to be the lefty, John Bertrand. Um, they started Austin, Tim Austin Temple against Tennessee game one, but that was probably just more for strategic regions. We just want to throw that out there. We think it's going to be Bertrand, um, the transfer from Furman. He's been their ace all year. He's got a sub three ERA. He's really good. Um, anything you want to add about Bertrand or, you know, what Texas might see from the lefty? Yeah. You know, Bertrand, um, as you said, he's been solid all year, 20 walks against 107 strikeouts. He's thrown 103 innings. So he's been their, their workhorse, um, not unlike Pete Hansen. He's got a two, six, nine ERA. Uh, he's had 17 starts. So, I mean, nine wins out of 17 starts isn't terrible. They, that's a pretty good ratio. So the team really responds behind him. He's a third team all American. He's a two time first team all ACC. And then uh, he was on the Golden Spikes midseason award watch list. Obviously, he's not going to win it. Just can again mail that trophy down to Dishwalk Field along with a Dick Hauser. Um, th the stuff won't blow you away. Like when I see him pitch, you know, he's obviously much bigger than, St uh, than Hansen. He's got a couple inches on him. But it, you know, he's just got a great command of the zone. He wants to go in out. He wants to go up down. His fastball is going to sit 88 to 91. Um, you know, if Texas wants to prepare against this guy, just, just watch some Hanson tape. I mean, it's, it's really kind of eerie how similar they are. It's when I started watching tape on him, I was like, wait, did Hanson transfer to Notre Dame? And no one told me what, what's going on with these ugly uniforms. Um, so yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how Texas responds to him because you know, Texas is essentially a full right-handed lineup anyways. You know, they throw EK in there, yeah. um, but otherwise every single one's a righty. So it negates that left-handed pitching at times, but then obviously left-handed hitters, they're still just, they're deceptive. They're tough. I can't trust them because, you know, they're left-handed. And so they, they do make it really tough on them. Um, yeah. There's a question too, because yeah. both teams, they hit a lot of homers. I mean, Notre Dame doesn't hit quite as many as Texas did at Dish Fog this year with the wind blowing out every single game. But um, that's not going to be the case in Omaha. The park plays big, as most people are aware of. 
Yep. It's going to be about manufacturing runs, base running mistakes. Um, going to have to clean those up. Um, not talking to anyone specifically, Douglas Hodo. It would be good if Texas was really good on the bases this weekend. Play clean defense, and then situational hitting is going to be huge. Um, two out hits, being able to get a guy in from third with less than two outs, being able to hit and run, drop a sacrifice bunt if necessary. Stuff like that's going to be a difference. Um, Notre Dame has solid arms out of the bullpen. Texas, I, one thing I will say about uh, the Friday game, Texas does not play on Saturday, win or lose. Lucas Gordon is going to be available out of the bullpen. I'm not 100% sure we'll see him. He hasn't pitched out of the bullpen in a long time. Texas does have some relievers that are pitching well lately, but he'll be available, and I would not be shocked if we see him in a big spot. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. And the counterpunch to that is uh, Notre Dame has a freshman, Jack Finley. Yep. Uh, he's been really, really good this year. Obviously, he's made some starts, but he also has three saves. He pitched some absolute massive innings against Tennessee during the Super Regional. Um, he's a lefty with an upper 80s fastball again, mid-70s curve. He reminds me of a, a much bigger and improved version of Harrison to some extent. So they're definitely going to see him. The other guy that Notre Dame likes to roll out is Alex Rao and then uh, Aiden Tyrell. So all three of those guys are definitely going to be seen or have the potential to be seen depending on how the game goes against Notre Dame. But, you know, it, it's funny because I think we talked about it before, but Texas is built for a super regional. They're not necessarily built as well for a regional or even college World series just because they don't have a third starter. Now, maybe that's different with Stevens, but I would not be surprised because of that day off. You know, if they go Hanson to Southern to Stevens or Hanson to Stevens to Southern in that game one, depending on how it's how it's looking, um, because like I said, you, you don't win the first game. Your odds of getting to even the championship series are very, very low. So there's it, it'll be a tough matchup. Um, you know, if you look at the numbers, they're not great and are, you know, overpowering for Notre Dame. They're hitting just under 300. They got 75 home runs. They got 202 walks. They got 410 strikeouts. So they don't strike out a lot comparatively. On the stolen bases, uh, they're 78 of 96. So they they steal much more than Texas, but Texas hasn't had to rely on stealing. They're a 980 fielding team. So that could come into play to some extent. 980 is still pretty darn solid. Um, and then their staff ERA is 395. Um, so I don't feel like there's any like just overwhelming advantage for either team other than it's going to be solid hitting against Texas pitching and then really good hitting against a solid and to good Notre Dame pitching squad. Yeah. I mean, it feels like it's going to be a tight game and it will just come down to all the little things that baseball has to offer. Um, let's take a quick look at the other two teams on this side of the bracket that we just love. Um, oh, so much. We're going to focus on, the second starters, because Texas will play either Oklahoma or A&M in game two. It'll either be a one and no winner's bracket game or it'll be an elimination game against one of those teams. If it's Oklahoma, um, we can expect to see David Sandlin. He's got a 5.54 ERA. He's got a 1.39 whip. He went six scoreless um, and with seven Ks against Texas earlier in the year, not in the Big 12 tournament, but in the original series that was in Arlington. He will be the likely number two starter, Cade Horton. Um, Texas remembers him from the Big 12 tournament. He's been pitching well in the NCAA tournament. He's on a bit of a heater, so there's a chance you could see him start. Um, I know you said that probably expect to see Sandlin. Horton will definitely be available out of the bullpen, especially if it's an elimination game scenario. Yeah. So that's what you can expect to see from Oklahoma, and then um, I'll let you add to that and then touch on Micah Dallas, who will be the AM number two starter. Yeah, you know, I just think Skip is going to go with the horses that got him there. So they'll definitely roll out Sandlin. Um, Skip probably will have a pretty quick hook in game two. Um, Either way, yeah. Re regardless, um, because he does have options. You know, Trevin Michael has pitched really, really well. Yeah. Kate Horton, as you mentioned, has pitched really, really well. Um, so he, he, Skip is really, really comfortable with where his bullpen is at right now. And I think he'll, you know, he's not afraid to have a quick hook and, you know, get someone else in there that can just hammer strikes. A&M, very likely they're going to go to the Texas Tech transfer, Micah Dallas. Yep. Uh, Texas is very familiar with him, like I said, because he pitched at Texas Tech. He also threw an inning, I believe, in relief against Texas earlier in the season on the, during the yep. midweek game. He's got a 5 or a 540 ERA and a 149 whip. 
you know, his numbers really don't, don't tell the true story. He's a hard, hard throwing. He's going to hit 95, 96. He's just a hard throwing righty. Um, he's got a lot of experience against big 12 against sec teams and he's had good success. Um, the, uh, the big name out of the bullpen, which is probably the biggest weakness for A&M very similar to Texas is their bullpen, but uh, Palish has been really good. He's a lefty that's been heavily used. And that's like Schloss, Schloss's number one guy out of the bullpen is, Hey, throw him out there, eat some innings, get some outs and like help us get our offense back on the field to win it. And they've played plenty of games where they've come from behind with their offense. So, but you know, yeah. it's not a team that you can count out by any stretch of the means. Yeah. Obviously when there's a matchup going on between Oklahoma and A&M, you know, there's, there's no one to root for. You can only root for, you know, destruction, you know, ridiculous rain delays, um, just bad stuff to happen in general. But if there is anything to specifically root for from a Texas fan perspective, you want to see Palish have to throw a lot of pitches for whatever reason. You want to see Trevin Michael have to throw a lot of pitches for whatever reason, because those are the two respective, you know, super relievers for those teams that have been really good. They both shown the ability to, shut the door in close games, but also be extended for multiple innings and be really effective. And um, Texas, the less you can see, or, I mean, those guys will be available game two, regardless with the day off in between games. I mean, Palish and Michael are going to pitch against Texas, whichever one it is. But if they have to throw 50 pitches or 60 pitches on Friday, that could help. They could just be a little more worn down. So if there's anything to root for, um, that would be it. Um, you know, that's all I kind of have to add about those two teams and then we'll see what happens from there. Yeah, for sure. Yep. And then some overall thoughts and keys to success that I jotted down just in Omaha overall, um, man, on this Texas side of the bracket, it feels like four very evenly matched baseball teams. I mean, I would take Hanson and Gordon as the best one, two punch, but I mean, Bennett and Sandlin are good. I mean, there's just no, there's no clear favorite out of those four teams. There's no clear underdog. I mean, Oklahoma, they've won the Big 12 tournament. They're coming in red hot after winning the regional and the super regional. Um, A&M didn't lose a game in the regional or the super regional. Obviously, Notre Dame is coming in on top of the world after knocking off one of the best teams we've ever seen in college baseball um, on their own home field just a lot of momentum. So that's one of my main thoughts. Um, clean defense, perfect base running. is going to come into play. It's going to be about clutch hitting, minimizing the walks. And then if you're going to pick one X factor for Texas, it's still going to be Tristan Stevens for me in that super relief um, role. They're really going to need a guy to come in and shut things down. The thing I like about Stevens is obviously the experience, the mental toughness, the competitiveness. You just love all that in the Omaha setting. He's been there before. The thing that scares me is the ballpark. It's huge. There's a lot of room for bloopers. They can dump hits in. Ground balls can find holes often against Stevens, as we've seen. It's going to be really important for him to have the slider working because for him, we know the slider is the strikeout pitch. And when you get in a big park that can yield a lot of bloopers, we're not expecting many homers. So that means those two out bloopers with a runner on second, you know, that blooper with a runner on third that gets the run in. Those are going to be important, and those tend to happen against Tristan just because he does do a good job of pitching to contact, which is normally what you want, but I'm hoping he's got that slider working so he can get some strikeouts in these big spots because that's what they're going to need. And because of that reason, I like the idea of rolling out Jared Southard um, pretty often whenever there's runners on base. I mean, it's, it's risky. Of course, it's risky with Southard because he has a tendency to lose the zone sometimes. He can give up a long ball here and there, but – He's got such good upside with the strikeouts. I think anytime you can bring him in in a big spot, maybe you've got base loaded and one out, and you really need to go to a guy that can get a strikeout. I think at that point, I like the idea of rolling the dice with Southern. So Tristan Stevens and Southern out of the bullpen, any out of all the people on the team, those are kind of my X factors. Um, what are your main thoughts and keys to success for Texas, um, obviously, this weekend in the regional portion of play? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to me, it goes back to experience. Texas was here last year. Yeah. They know what it felt like. They have that taste in their mouth. They know what to expect rolling into Omaha. Um, if you look at the other teams that are here, a and hasn't been to Omaha in, in a little while. Like they don't have that experience. Now, Mike in Dallas playing with Texas Tech. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure he's been once. Um, OU has not been to Omaha in a while. Stanford was here last year. Arkansas 
We all know what they can do. They didn't make it last year, but they, you know, just giant failings. They've got a big target. Ole Miss and Auburn, um, you know, Auburn hasn't been in a little bit. And then Ole Miss, they were there a couple of years ago. But to me, like from the Texas side of the bracket, it comes down to experience. Um, at the end of the day, I think Hanson can pitch with anyone, uh, even though I think, you know, Hanson is very well matched up against um, Bertrand. Uh, at the end of the day, if I have to pick between two close teams, I'm going to go with the, the superior defense and the experience. So I, I would take Texas in game one. Um, man, that OU A&M game is, is going to be just tough because both those teams have been on absolute tears, but they're also two teams that you could see the pressure being too much in game one and just kind of falling apart to some extent. Love that. Love that. And so <clears throat> it, it, that, you know, that really worries me because everyone says, Oh, Omaha is no different. Omaha is a different beast. Omaha is an absolute different beast. Um, so if I look at the left side of the bracket, you know, I love the Texas experience. Um, I think Tristan Stevens is going to be like that X factor that you talked about. I think everyone's going to be talking like if Stevens can pitch well, Texas is suddenly a very, very different team pitching wise. No and now you combine that with the number one offense and the number one defense, they become, you know, I've seen some betting favorites and Texas is up there. Uh, and I don't think that's any surprise. So yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what the bullpen can do. Um, I yep. think they, I think they have a lot of momentum too, coming off that EC, ECU win, coming back and then just absolutely dominating that game three. So, yeah, no, I mean every team, obviously every team in Omaha is coming in with momentum, but this year even more so, with just some of the crazy wins that we've seen across the country. Um, yeah. The other half of the bracket, I mean, we'll get to it, you know, basically right now. But man, it's just it feels like a total toss up. I mean, Stanford, Stanford is a really good lineup, but their pitching is kind of in flux right now. Um, Zach, the next time we do a show will be next week. Um, it'll either be a recap or we'll be previewing Texas in the um, championship series. You might be doing it live from Omaha. That would be exciting. Yeah. Um, but we got to make picks. Um, the people want picks. We got to put it out there. Man, I mean, before I give my pick, I just want to say this has to be the most evenly matched field of eight in a very long time. I mean, I just can't remember – going into Omaha without a clear underdog. I mean, you could say Ole Miss because they were one of the last teams in, but just the way they're playing right now, I just don't feel like they're this massive underdog Cinderella story. Yeah. And with no Tennessee, there's no major favorite. I feel like all eight teams are very bunched together. You can give me any championship series combination, any of the four teams from bracket one, any of the four teams from bracket two. I'm not going to be shocked by the championship matchup. Um, I have to pick one. I, I obviously don't want this to be the case. I would pick Oklahoma versus Auburn. I think right now Oklahoma is just, they're on a tear. They've got Jake Bennett as the ace. They've got Trevin Michael as a super reliever. Kate Horton's coming on strong at the right time of the year just to be that extra starter that they might need. And then the offense is just red hot, led by Peyton Graham. Um, I think they're the team right now that, is built most to come out of this side of the bracket. But like I said, it is a complete utter coin flip to me. I think Texas has a great shot. I think Notre Dame has a great shot. I mean, it's just, it's going to be one of those weeks where it's just going to be pure chaos. Every game could be tied going into the seventh, eighth inning. It's going to come down to some blue pits, some clutch strikeouts, maybe some diving plays. Um, it's going to be crazy. If you made me pick two teams, I would go Oklahoma and Auburn, but it's, it's going to be insane. Who do you have? Yeah, I mean, this, like the left side of the bracket, I think is going to be the talk of the town because it is just madness. Um, but starting on the right side of the bracket, where we have Arkansas versus Stanford and Ole Miss versus Auburn in the first game. Yep. I mean, three of those teams are from not only the SEC, but from the SEC West. Like, that's just ridiculous. And then yeah. you throw in AM, four teams from the SEC West made Omaha this year. Um, I think the magic runs out for Ole Miss. You know, it's a great story for Tim Elko and the seniors, but. You know, realistically, I, I think Auburn could take game one. And so if I look at the other side and it's Arkansas versus Stanford, I really like Stanford a lot, but I'm not, I'm not picking against Arkansas at that point. So tough. Um, and I, I honestly, you know, I think maybe Texas State exposed some of the weaknesses of Stanford 
their pitching hasn't quite looked as sharp as it did earlier in the season. It, it's not good right now. I mean, they're really yeah. struggling, but they've got bats mm-hmm. everywhere. But but they've got bats everywhere. Um, so I'm going to take Arkansas on the in the championship series from the right side. Um, but it, it's to me, it's between Arkansas and Stanford. Whoever wins that first game is going to be there. And then on the left side, I think Texas has enough to get by Notre Dame. And so for me, it's that 1-0 game. In, in, in of course, one Oh game, like, of course the winner has a great chance, but I mean, it, it literally will come down to that game um, because Texas A&M doesn't have the bullpen to really drive them there, but they've got something magical working under Schloss. Texas has the experience. They have Tristan Stevens, Oklahoma, you know, they've been on a tear since, you know, the last, what, three weeks of the season. They've just been on an absolute heater and nothing against Notre Dame. I think they could very well come back through but I trust the big 12 teams more. So in OU and Texas, uh, I'm going to go Texas, but I mean, it very easily could be a and M. I think for whatever reason, Sloss has some kind of magic working there, but I'll go Texas versus Arkansas in the, you know, in the old, uh, the old Southwest conference showdown in the, in the championship series, Texas versus Arkansas, man, that would be, that would be something to see. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we saw, yeah, just unreal. Um, I mean, this has been a long episode, so we'll go ahead and uh, get out of here. Let everyone get on with their days that's listening. Um, to anyone that watched the show, obviously, thank you for watching. Feel free to leave a comment. Um, subscribe to the video. Subscribe to the Orange Bloods YouTube page. Like the video, um, orangebloods.com. Um, Zach had an awesome game recap of all the games in the Super Regional. I had a piece on just the crazy season that Texas has been through and how they kind of big picture made it to Omaha. We're going to have preview stuff coming out. We'll obviously – have recaps, uh, game threads. The game thread on Sunday, man, got up to a crazy amount of views and pages. 145,000 views. We had, of course, five-hour rain delay helps. We had, um, I think we were 30 pages deep with only one out in the top of the first inning. Yes, um, that was that was some good stuff. There, there was some there was some insanity happening on the message board on, on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, you can uh, obviously follow us on Twitter. Zach will be in Omaha. He'll have boots on the ground. You can follow him at Zach at the Dish. Um, I will be locked in from the couch. Um, I will be giving analysis on every game, not just the Texas games. I'll be tweeting about games on both sides of the bracket, a and Oklahoma, the pitching usage. Um, I'll be having game recaps after every game. So, Zach, you can take a deep breath. Um, you no longer have to cover me with those. You can try to get a little bit of sleep in Omaha. So I'll be there with the game recaps after the game. We, we, um, sleep, in July, guys, man. we sleep in July. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're in the home stretch. Um, hopefully Texas is not done yet, but we'll see. It's going to be just a really exciting tournament. I'm excited about all the games. I um, hope everyone enjoys watching. Um, and with that, just hook them. We'll see what happens. Hook them.